Hello and welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of Intelligent Transport and Harkon, I'd like to thank you all very much for attending. I'm your moderator, Joshua Minchin, Assistant Editor of Intelligent Transport, and I'm delighted to be joined today by today's speakers. We've got Gerd van Beveren, who's Sales Director at Siemens Mobility, and he is joined by Ulush Langer, Head of Sales Management and Pre-Sales Consulting at EOS Uptrade. Now, following today's presentation, we will move on to a live question and answer session where you can pose questions to the speakers directly. Please remember, you can submit questions at any point during the webinar at all using the questions panel situated in the menu on the right hand side of your screen. We're here today to talk about business models in the sphere of mobility as a service. During the session, Gerd and Ulrich will explore what lessons have been learned from the progress of MASS so far and where the concept goes from here. Now that's quite enough of me, I think, so I will now pass over to today's speakers to get things started. Okay, thank you, Josh. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very uh, pleased to uh, participate and present to you. Before we start, maybe a quick introduction of ourselves. Um, you introduced already uh, Uli and myself. And as you can see on the left uh, top uh, uh, corner, uh, we are belonging to a group of uh, companies uh, around Siemens uh, with Hakon, AS Uptrade, Pada Mobility and Bytemark. And all of them are legally entities uh, which are fully owned by Siemens. So we are one family of Siemens companies fully dedicated to one vision and that is providing a sustainable and seamless travel for a better quality of life. Of course, this is more like a vision statement on a high level. But if you look at what we really can bring to the table, you can see some of the, the phrases uh, on, on the bottom line. It's We're talking about mobility as a service, uh, ticketing and payments, but also demand responsive transport or DRT. We also have timetable and rail capacity, analytics, because a lot of things are going and will be set around uh, uh, the data as well. And with all of these um, capabilities and portfolio elements, we are able to um, make this vision a reality. And that we can do this, we have proven in many uh, reference and projects. Um, we are present in more than 150 regions globally, uh, references in 25 uh, countries and even more. And I think the best uh, demonstration of our uh, capabilities is on the fact that we have uh, our apps which we have in Play Store and in Google Store are uh, have been downloaded downloaded for more than 200 million uh, times so I think that's a, a, a great result and on the left hand side you can see some of our customers uh, Deutsche Bahn uh, but also in the States with uh, um, BART in San Francisco, Cap Metro and Austin, uh, SNCF um, in Middle East, uh, Dubai, and so on and so on. So I think the list goes on for longer. So this is um, who we are. If we look at how we are uh, positioned, um, we are in the middle between um, two main stakeholders in the market. So the first one are represented at the top. These are the passengers, and we are providing the technology of which the front-end solutions are used by passengers. I think what it exactly is, I will come back to you later on to this. The second part are the operators and the infrastructure um, service providers uh, themselves. They use our technology either for offering the services in a B2C mode, a mode to the passengers, or they also can use this for improving their operations and using the data or the, the tools to really improve services that they bring uh, to the market. Josh, maybe before we go into the, the topic of today with the, the, the mass and the uh, business models and so on, maybe a quick poll would be good just to set the scene and to get uh, feedback from uh, the audience. Absolutely, yeah. So let's get that check from the audience. So the question we're asking you today is, what do you see as the biggest challenge in implementing a mass platform? And the options you've got in front of you are technical integration and data management, compliance with legal and organisational requirements, alignment of the commercial interests of all stakeholders, or making the platform attractive to end users. So I'll just read that out again one more time. What do you see as the biggest challenge in implementing a mass platform? technical integration and data management, compliance with legal and organisational requirements, 
alignment of the commercial interests of all stakeholders, making the platform attractive to end users. So I'll just give the audience a few more seconds just to get their answers in. Okay, so quite a decisive result there. So 17% of you said technical integration and data management was the biggest challenge in implementing a mobility as a service platform. 14% said compliance with legal and organizational requirements. 18% said making the platform attractive to end users, but 50% of you said alignment of the commercial interests of all stakeholders. Ulrich, was that what you were expecting from um, from that poll, or, or are you surprised by the results? No, um, it, it mirrors very much uh, the situation in the, in the market. And if we can go back to the next slide, you will also see uh, why this is uh, the case. Um, if we look at the market and how the, the mass market is and has been uh, developing, um, it's easy to um, map it with the, uh, the Gardner hype cycle, where we went already through the huge uh, hype uh, four or five years ago, uh, triggered by technology and mainly also by the B2C companies that are uh, promising the big numbers. And then, uh, like always, it's uh, going down to the <laughs> disillusionments. Um, but uh, what we see right now is definitely the technology has been put in place. Uh, technology is there. I think this was also um, represented in the poll results. Technology is not the issue anymore. It's probably more to, if you would like to continue the curve, picking it up, the part that is probably missing to go to the plateau of productivity is exactly the business model to get the things right, to get the commercial um, uh, agreements in place, the roles and responsibilities. And therefore, I'm not surprised. It's uh, it's good to see that the audience is exactly um, having the same view than, than we have uh, concerning uh, this one. Um, if we just look at the challenges, because that was the, the, the question, if we look at what uh, um, Rob Bitz, my colleague, and he's a product owner for Mars at, uh, in our unit, if you ask him what are the challenges for Mars in the next coming years, his answer is very clear. It's really about putting all the different players together and see how they can work together. But the most important part is really about finding the right model where every player in the platform gets a fair share of the success. And I think that is also what we would like to try to answer today in this session is what is this, what is this model and how can we assure that every player can find and identify the success that he has. So if we first look at a little bit about finding the right model, maybe it's good to find out what are the success factors that needs to be identified uh, in order to find the model. And I think everybody in this audience is quite familiar with uh, what mass should bring to the table, for the passenger at least. Uh, it starts with information and planning. And there, I think it's crucial that from the first download that people have on with an app, that the data needs to be accurate and it, the usage of the app needs to be highly uh, convenient. If that is not the case, people will download it, they will use it, they won't find the information that they are looking for, they don't see that it's uh, matching with the real situation around them, they will put it aside, even deinstall and never come back. So that is crucial to have those two elements and that's the reason why at the minimum uh, the app should have this kind of uh, uh, backbone of public transport and then combining it with the first and last mile. But it doesn't stop there. It needs to go on with fulfilling the whole chain of services. And the next one is definitely the booking ticket and payments. I think it's crucial. Everybody understands and accepts now the, the information and planning. That's uh, very common. Uh, if we go into the session of the booking and the payment on an intermodal way, then we go into the next level of expectations where people don't accept anymore to register themselves uh, multiple times. They just want to hand it in one time, making sure that the accounts are there and that they're only used for the purpose that they serve and not that it's uh, publicly known. And the third component is definitely that during the travel that people are not just are stuck with the information that they got and uh, entered, 
but also that they are updated by real-time information, especially in disruptions, because that is then where the app can be the most beneficial and valuable for people when they are lost. Commuters, you don't need to tell them where the office is, but they are very interested to see if there are any disruptions, how they can still get to the office in time, maybe by some other means and in uh, maybe another time frame. But getting this information is uh, highly uh, uh, needed. So from this um, business um, model, um, if we go from the, the the, the critical success factors and if we understand how people are looking for uh, implementing mobility as a service and we're talking about business models uh, there are several ways of calculating business cases so i don't uh, have the pretension to say look this is the way but this represents uh, it very well of the main topics that should be included uh, we can divide it in two parts. It's the left-hand side, which is representing the cost structure, maybe external costs by partners that you include, but also own resources that you need for, um, for instance, um, working on, on developments, uh, but it also could be data that you um, uh, acquire, and also the activities that needs to be done in order to uh, justify uh, the um, services that you provide. And on the right hand side, of course, needs to be balanced or uh, not in balance, but in a higher uh, element for the revenue streams uh, where these can be characterized by um, who, to whom am I delivering the services so the customer segments, how will I address them, the channels that I will use and how will I build up this relationship with them in terms of, of customer relationship. And in the middle of all of this, and this is really the key point. It's about a value proposition. Everybody in the business model needs first to define the value proposition that he brings, then build around the business case uh, of uh, how it all fits together and make sure that the business case is um, fitting very well. So if we look at the value proposition, I think it's uh, good to uh, identify the the stakeholders that are involved and that needs to be um, to the next slide. Yeah, here we go. Uh, to the stakeholders and looking at their interest to identify the value proposition that they uh, bring. Uh, the the first one is of course the, the passenger, and the passenger um, is just looking for value for money. Yeah, he wants the information. He wants also to have the services for the mobility service. He will also might uh, looking for incentives like a loyalty program and so on. And that's probably an easy one. Everybody recognize this situation. A little bit more diverse is the situation on the top level where we have um, the, the city and the operators who are the, the uh, stakeholders, the parties who are bringing the services to the end user and they have different interests. The city has more strategic interests, either reducing the, the traffic jams, in, uh, reducing the CO2 emission, maybe strategic decisions of, about how they would like to balance the traffic in the city, um, or even how they would like to route people when they are traveling within the city. And as you can see, these are non-financial targets in a lot of cases. The operator, um, they need either on a private level, on private operator, look at the revenues. If it's a public, they most likely will have some contracts and they need to fulfill their obligations. Maybe they have some KPIs, but they have a very clear set of indications what they would like to achieve. And then finally, we also have the new mobility providers. In most cases, they are private and they are driven in um, mostly with some uh, revenue targets in mind to um, satisfy the shareholders. So if we know these stakeholders, and again, they are not new, but if we look at it compared with the business model uh, question that we have on the table is it's becoming more complex because each of the stakeholders, each of the players involved need to make sure that he is calculating his business case and on top, the overall business case also needs to be uh, um, satisfying. Um, that means that the mass providers from their part need to verify the business model. The owners of the platform needs to uh, in, get informed about the, uh, 
uh, the, the, um, the business model, but also the verific verification service providers, the payment service providers, the service contractors, and so on and so on. And there it gets a little bit tricky. So each of them needs to make this, and each of them will encounter some challenges when building the business case. And when we look at the market and we uh, get some feedback about what those challenges are, this is a list of feedback that we got from the market, from our customers, from our contacts about what the challenges are for them when they are making their business cases. Number one, data. It's coming back over and over again. There's also a, a large hype, but it's, uh, it's inevitable to uh, uh, include data as part of the business model because it will be important as an entry point of providing the services, but at the same time also, it can be a source of revenue if you own the data. And that's one of the elements also if that people recommend to own the data, not giving it away, and then uh, very expensively buy it back. Tricky part is that data, of course, everybody would like to possess this. And in certain cases, also direct competitors are involved in the business model. And therefore, we need to be very careful about the data, how this is uh, served within the um, ecosystem of this mass, but also how we can guarantee GDPR compliance on the, on the personal data, but also the data level of each of the players that they can access and that they can contribute. But it's doable. We have shown this many times. Another part is also on the, pub, the public and the private, and cooperation of boats might generate some conflicts. Uh, it also might give some uh, advantages, of course, but that is definitely an element that needs to be uh, uh, verified, especially because the public part will be, uh, in most countries, regulated and will be depend from country to country. So there is not this kind of uh, business model that can be applied in every country. No, it needs to be verified with the, uh, the, the persons and the countries. And without going to all of them, but the last but one bullet point I think is also important is that uh, the economic uh, positions um, and the power that the people bring into this. Uh, let's take an example of a large mainline uh, rail company compared to micro mobility with a bike sharing in a, in a smaller city. The balance of the interests are, of course, not good. So it's interesting to see how still both players can be satisfied with participating and coming to a fair agreement and of course that will be uh, interesting to see how they can come to this fair commercial agreement so in order to cope with all those challenges um what we identified again is what needs to be defined i think it's quite obvious um uh, the roles and responsibilities it's a no-brainer it needs to be clear for everybody and although it's it's it seems to be a no-brainer it's not always applied and therefore i only can insist make it clear who is delivering what what are the responsibilities and what are the agreements between the parties uh, we also need to make sure that the the guidance the local guidance are respected and especially also for competition law i will come back to that uh, later on and also that um um, uh, that the, the marketing and the go-to market that then is also represented. Some people can benefit from a stronger market uh, position and activities without that they are responsible for it. Also there, of course, they need to say, okay, how can they uh, influence this? How can they make sure that they can benefit from this? And that is also something that needs to be agreed between the stakeholders. So, one element if we come to how it can be set up uh, one thing that is sure from what we observe in the market is there are many alternatives there is not this one size fits all it doesn't exist um, and mainly it will be driven by the fact if the mass platform or the data pool um, is serving just one app as you can see on the, the bottom line, or if the same pool of data, the same data platform will be used by multiple uh, providers, multiple mass providers, it will become more complex. The business model will become more complex and also the agreement on the data need to be verified much more uh, sensitively and carefully. 
and therefore I think it's uh, important to identify first how this setup will be and then from there the other parts that we identified and just mentioned um, can be clarified and answered uh, more quickly. So I think, uh, Josh, this was a little bit of theory about the business model. Uh, um, let, let, let's see how, if we talk about mass platform providers, who would be the best part of this? Maybe you can take over for the poll of this one. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's read the temperature of the audience once again. So the second question we're asking you today is, who do you think is best suited to initiate and manage a mobility as a service platform? And the options you've got to choose from are public transport operators or public transport authorities, municipalities, mobility service providers, tech companies or other. So I'll just read that again for you one more time. Who do you think is best suited to initiate and manage a mobility as a service platform? Public transport operators or public transport authorities, municipalities, mobility service providers, tech companies or other. So we'll just leave that a few seconds for everyone to get their answers in. Please do get your responses in. We're really keen to hear from you. And likewise, we're really keen to put your questions to our two speakers today. So please do get them in using the question panel on the right hand side of your screen. OK, so a little bit closer this time, but still a decisive winner. So who do you think is best suited to initiate and manage a mass platform? 4% of you said other. 20% of you said tech companies, 13% of you said mobility service providers, 22% said municipalities, but the clear winner with 41% of the vote was public transport operator slash public transport authorities. Ulrich, your thoughts on that? What you expected or is that a surprise to you? Well, maybe uh, this answer could be expected somehow from who we uh, know is sitting in the audience. And our experience shows that indeed those stakes, stakeholders in the mobility market are extremely keen to prove that. So, uh, because uh, I guess they are the backbone of the public transport. They are also responsible for the alternative or complementary uh, mob mobility offers. So I guess, so I'm not uh, very surprised. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, let's, let's, have a let's have a look on the stakeholders' interests. Of course, we know that the public is eager to reduce the impact of motorized individual traffic, be it the rolling, be it standing or parking traffic. It's all about emissions and congestions that we all agree have to be reduced. This is also the main goal of public transport, and it's not their main goal to fight the economical success of cars. So it's fine that on the other side, mobility service providers try to earn some profit with their services and their data, be it account data or mobility behavior data. Don't forget the user um, well, who seeks a convenient service, especially as he shall be convinced to use the platform to change from his private car to multimodal transport and not so much from public transport to private motorized mobility. So the services offered by the mobility uh, platform, as Hurt said, have to fit to the customer's needs too. And this also means that the services offered have to be offered at a reasonable price. That's where the circle is closing. To be successful with your transport strategies, you will have to find a business model which is accepted by the people who are supposed to use your mobility platform. So from this point of view, it seems to be obvious that platforms should be managed by public authorities, the so-called regulators. Uh, sorry, that was too fast. Now, here we go. Um, I guess we all agree on, um, well, the fact that there have to be regulations, not only because of transport strategies, but also because integrated mobility won't work without public money spent to provide services in areas and at times where no private operator would offer his services not if their goal is making profits at least. So when we have a look at this chart coming from a report on the expected role of public authorities engaged in mobility platforms, the laissez-faire approach on, on the bottom of this uh, table 
uh, skipping away all responsibility, but also manageability of public authorities, and thus influence not to speak about enforcing public transport strategies. So uh, uh, we can think about whether the self-governing or governing by doing approach can be successful. Well, that can be discussed. If p uh, public transport operators can provide mobility solutions, why not public transport authorities as well? To state it clearly, what we see in this picture is not our recommendation, it's rather our experience from accompanying the market for years now. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, overregulation seems to be unfavoring competition and innovation, so that we mostly see govern, governing, governing by enabling uh, uh, is needed. Uh, uh, in some way uh, to, to convince uh, authorities. <clears throat> but it will enable public-private interaction, keeps the focus on strategic objectives, and helps to fund projects which are trying to reach these objectives. One key objective <clears throat> of public authorities is, of course, the provision of a discrimination-free offer. This isn't meant regarding the access of mobility service providers to the market in the first, first place, but the access of all users to the mobility services, regardless of their physical, mental or cognitive abilities and competences. But also the different needs and constraints of the passengers have to be regarded. This is, how they, this is the question, how they need to travel, with whom they travel, what they are carrying around, which activities they want to pursue, and in the end, very simply, what the weather is like, for example. There are specific needs with everyone, and there are good reasons why we have public and individual transports, which we are trying to combine in mobility platforms in a sustainable way. So I click further for the whole. Um, well, data quality is the key to enabling platforms to inform correctly and to offer services fitting to the individual needs. Nowadays, um, as Gerd also said, it's not only timetables, real-time data, it's also parameters for strategies that seamlessly have to go hand in hand with business strategies documented in contracts and executed by the platform's algorithms. So the business model of a platform can only work with someone orchestra orchestrating the data, be it open access for discrimination free use, but also protecting sensitive data from abuse. And not only once when setting up the platform thanks to a funding program, but constantly during a hopefully long and lasting operation period with stable and reliable partners using quality assurance processes. Bad data lead to misinformation, which will destroy trust in the system and endanger its success. But now enough theory. Let's see what experience we have gained in our reference project so far and what we might see in the upcoming projects, which we just started in the last month. Gerd, what can you tell us about it? Yeah, thank you, Ulri. Uh, I think it's like you said. I mean, maybe enough with the theory. Let's have a look at uh, the market and what we uh, can see uh, from there. From all the uh, lessons learned that we have uh, gathered right now, I think if we look into the mass project of the last uh, couple of um, months and years, I can click to the next slide, please. Yeah, okay, so this is uh, the one. Um, we have seen that, uh, like you have seen from the curve, tremendous number of uh, tenders and projects awarded uh, related mass have come to the, the market. Uh, we were in the, the nice and luxury position that have we, we have been awarded uh, numerous of them, and uh, they can be either national or regional. On a national level, Reiseplan, for instance, in uh, Denmark, but also recently uh, with uh, Renfe in uh, Spain or uh, Revere in the Netherlands, but also regional mass platforms have been established. Uh, you can see some of them there, Luxembourg, Andorra, uh, BART in San Francisco, also Dubai, 
Venezuela was ready in place since uh, five years now, very successfully, but also um, Berlin with the BVG app. So I think we can draw from a lot of ex um, um, experiences there. And if I would like to use the time in the remaining uh, 10, 15 minutes to deep dive into two spe specific ones and also reflect on the elements of their business cases. So let's take a first one, which is a uh, rise plan, uh, which is um, it, it, it's an exceptional app, I have to say. Yeah? I haven't come across this because, first of all, um, if you consider that Denmark has um, around about 6 million inhabitants, more than 3.7 million downloads so uh, used it. So it's the seventh most popular app in Denmark. And why is this so popular? Because if people are going to look for it yeah, with 1 million daily searches, in 75% they find what they're looking for. And uh, that is, is, is tremendous because if you go and you ask people on the street, do you know the Rise Plan app? 90% will say yes. The reason why it is so successful, I think, are three elements. The first one is it's the quality of the data. And I will explain how they get it later on. The second one is def definitely about the convenience and how people are handling the data, how they are guided through the flow of using the app. And the third factor definitely is also the comprehensiveness. All of the transportation modes in Denmark are included, and I also will come back to them how they realize this. If you go and you look at it, uh, again, it's um, not um, so uncommon if you look at what Reiseplan is offering, but it's uh, simply nice. You can have this uh, going from A to B, of course, here it's in, in Danish, but you can have it in other languages uh, as well. And then you can get all the data and information that is requested based on your uh, favorites, based on your preferences, based on the settings that you have done. And it also has been included and integrated with the payment parts. In some cases, it's directly with the service providers, but for the public transport, it's integrated with the Reise card. Um, which is the uh, stored value card in Denmark for payment. And that is, of course, very convenient because then it is all handled in, in one app. And, of course, it's integrated with all transportation modes, inter truly intermodal. Even demand responsive transport has been included. And it indicates, uh, like one would expect, also the number of stops, the, 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 the fare prices, the number of time that it uh, gets, the alternatives, and so on. Reiseplan, or nowadays it's Reiseplan, Reisequat, which is the company, offers uh, the three services for the Reiseplan part. Um, I don't need, I don't want to uh, explain the whole business of uh, that company, but if we look at the mass-related parts, uh, they have ser different service areas that are um, the basis of guaranteeing this uh, success. First of all, they have their own app. They also can give this away for as a white label to third parties and they are owning the data which they also are willing to share as open data to third parties i think these are some components that are the foundations of the uh, the success and uh, as i mentioned before in terms of comprehensiveness and the data quality the setup that they have done is that Rise Plan is a company with the shareholders are public transport operators the main ones in denmark so not just the rail operator, the Danish rail, DSB, but also uh, other rail op uh, public transport operators that you can see in the inner circle. That's the core business, and that is also driving the whole uh, transportation app uh, in Denmark. But they didn't stop there. They also included all other players in the market, be it the public transportation parts, as at the mobility parts that you can see on the lower elements and even included and say, if you would like to use your own car, then yes, please do. And I will provide also the information uh, for you. So if you look at who they have included, I think the, the smart way is definitely that um, the, they own the data. And that's the reason why they can also guarantee that the data is the best and that they also can provide this to Google and Google Maps and, and they're using these uh, services of uh, Rise of Plan, uh, but also public transport as the core of this uh, ecosystem and that they included 
uh, with uh, some interest for all players the um, participation in this uh, model. I think this is one great example that we have uh, seen in the market. Uh, a second one is in the Netherlands where um, uh, it's called Revere, it's a, a joint venture that uh, has been set up uh, last summer or in spring and the app that will come uh, very soon in autumn um, with the following characteristics. But maybe first Revere because it's not well known. Uh, what is Revere? Revere is a joint venture of three main public uh, operators in the Netherlands. The first one is the Dutch Railway NS, Nederland Spoorwegen. You have the uh, public transport operator in Rotterdam, RET, and in Den Haag, HTM. And together they had the joint venture where they are having, uh, they will develop and they're developing because they have uh, awarded in a public tender, um, a neutral non-profit technical platform. And they are positioning them in the market by providing this open backend platform as a technical platform between the mobility providers and the mass providers in the market. And I said mass providers, it's for all mass providers that are willing to connect to this platform. It's a technical platform because the commercial agreements, they leave up to the, between the mass providers and the mobility providers themselves. Uh, this has some advantages and disadvantages, but at least it gives the players some individual freedom. And I also will explain you later on why this also has been suggested in this market uh, due to some uh, regulations. So, um, as I said, they have integrated and it will be launched uh, very soon. Uh, but the, the, the good uh, part is definitely that the um, the mass providers will be multiple and that it's open. So it's not just for the shareholders and S, RIT and HTM. On the, contrary, on the contrary, they also would deliberately open it up to uh, other players in the market. If, if you ask Revere how they think that they, uh, what they, uh, the reasons why people should join the platform, they see mainly three elements. The first one is, they would like to get as much mobility providers connected to the platform as possible. And they also have set all the rules and regulations to join this um, with low entry barriers for the mobility providers. So there's almost no excuse uh, to participate, not to participate. Secondly, is that the platform will grow. Um, it is, um, will fulfill all the services and the functions that are uh, typical and would be requested by mass providers and they will be provided to API as the KO white label app. But I think the most important element definitely is that the costs will be shared. And that means that in this model of Revere that the mass providers will share the costs. In other terms, the more mass providers that will participate and connect to the platform and use the services through APIs the, 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 the cheaper it will be based on an API uh, cost uh, price and it, the more interesting it gets. So it's almost like a spiral um, and that's the reason why they definitely would like to see as in initially definitely already uh, a huge participation of all the players in the market and I'm very confident that this will be uh, the case. Revere sees four factors that will guide them to success. Um, first one, not strange, it's focus on, the, on the, uh, the traveler. That means that they would like to start very quickly with an MVP. It will be in uh, autumn uh, in the coming months, so to say, and definitely their priority is on the value that they can provide. They also on purpose said, okay, we would like to make it scalable. We will start a little bit uh, smaller. It's not so small, of course, because they already will integrate a lot of mobility and mass providers from the start, but it definitely will grow. And in order to make it also scalable, they also realize in the market that the standards are not always uh, available. And that's the reason why they said, okay, we will also integrate with non-proprietary standards um, not everybody has the TOMP API 
uh, or GTFS. So there is, we see that uh, we want to be open and go as fast as possible by integrating what is available in, in the market. As you can see, uh, Revere also have chosen to use existing technology with existing platforms, not to start from scratch. Um, they also have seen that the, the, the hype curve is now going down because of the technology being available. And that's the reason why they say, okay, let's use it and let's focus on the parts that are really um, new, the business model, attracting the, the mass and the mobility providers, and then from there going and strongly and setting this in the Dutch uh, market. And another element which is very particular but also very important is that they guarantee a neutrality. The, the technical platform, it's a technical platform on its own. There is no direct influence of the shareholders to the platform policies. I think this is important because the Dutch railway, of course, has a dominant position, uh, but they don't influence uh, the, the, the uh, the, the technical uh, parts and it also is needed because of the antitrust authority in the Netherlands and that is also coming from the EU and that they said okay yes you can form this joint venture if you apply different criteria to guarantee the neutrality of the platform in the Dutch market and I think without reading uh, all of them is that you can uh, recognize some easy parts like it needs to be open for everybody it uh, there is no exclusivity but it also needs to be providing access to other mass providers with open reporting and monitoring and so on and so on so i think this um, definitely helps to get a higher acceptance of the players around so that they're not afraid that they are dominated and also that allows some parallel platforms in the Dutch market if they would like to set them up. So I think this is something which I at least uh, found very interesting because it shows also the maturity level of the mass in the frameworks and the regulations that are happening at least in, in the European uh, countries. And maybe finally uh, from Revere, uh, they still are in the final phase to select which ones mobility services will be included. And here you see a long list is dating back from a couple of months, but uh, uh, they shared this uh, with me. So, and I had the, the, the opportunity and the, the freedom to share this with uh, you. And as you can see, it will cover um, most of the transportation modes going from car sharing, free or uh, um, station-based, bike sharing, again, station-based or free floating, uh, scooters, taxi, um, park and rides, public transport, of course, because it still will be the backbone, um, because these are the MSPs on top of, of course, the public transport in the Netherlands, and also the ferries like the water taxi in, in Rotterdam. So I'm very much looking forward to what uh, will be presented in uh, the coming months on Revere, and I'm very confident that the success will uh, be uh, growing in the Dutch market over the coming months and, and years. So concluding in what we've learned with the theory in the beginning, what Uli said about the, the role of the authorities that they can play as well, and some examples about uh, Reise Plan and, and also Revere in, the, in Europe, is uh, we can learn tons of things. And I think everybody in the audience can uh, derive what he wants. For me, I would like to uh, take the, the next four topics with me. First of all, I have been uh, observing that one should keep the end user in the focus. It's so important that we have them on board, that they are accepting the app. And of course, and, uh, even if you keep the passenger in the focus, don't forget the mobility service. Everybody needs to make sure that he has the, um, his interests uh, represented. Second uh, learning is it's good to start small, and stepwise grow, make sure that the platform can scale and it's very open so that there is no uh, lock-in. I think we have seen this in the majority of the tenders in the last couple of uh, uh, years, and that is a good becoming good practice. The third one is that uh, if you look at it, implementing it, we have seen that technology is just one side, but there are many other components and aspects that needs to be kept in mind when you set it up. 
commercially, legally, uh, marketing organizations, and so on and so on, that should be looked at from a holistic perspective. Comprehensive, uh, as I mentioned in the, the business model, each of the business models needs to make sense, uh, business oriented or value oriented, and in total, it also needs to sum up. But at the other side, the technological parts uh, should be deconnected from this, at least from uh, it needs to be neutral, and it also should be as open as possible that all different uh, models can be applied regardless how you are installing it. And maybe last uh, takeaway is that the technology is there. So I think that what we see that has been the most successful and the most um, quickly put into the market was based on existing technologies, existing standards, and then from there, build up the whole ecosystem with all the other topics and then we are sure that the curve will steeply go up again uh, towards um, a very productive mass system uh, when you set it up and i think uh, josh with this i would like to end the presentation hand over to you and open the floor for q a's thank you very much yeah and thank you Ulrich, as well for a really really interesting presentation some fantastic points um throughout We've had loads of questions come in from the audience, so we'll try and get through as many as we possibly can. But don't forget, you can still get your questions in. We've got around nine, ten minutes to get through these, so do send your questions in, and I'll put as many of them as I possibly can to get and Ulrich. So to kick things off, and I'll put this one to both of you, so feel free if one of you to start and the other one to jump in. Do you see a difference between regional and national scale mass platforms from a business perspective? Um, yes and no. Um, I, I think they can coexist. Yeah? There is not this one mass platform, and if you have one mass platform, a national one, that there is no possibility for other mass platforms. Um, as I mentioned, it needs to make sense, and in some cases it makes sense on an urban level, in some cases it makes sense on a national level. Um, the national level is mainly driven by mainline companies, like we have seen in Renfe, for instance, where they even have the first and last mile with over 20 cities that they will connect to this uh, national one. But uh, um, I think one of the most, if I reflect on this, the national ones, if they are driven by the main lines, uh, the, the, of course, the revenue stream is coming from the main line tickets, which is a little bit higher than if you do this on the multiple sides of the tickets on an urban level. Um, so I think it's driven by different things, but it can coexist. So there are some differences, but there's definitely an, 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 uh, an, some bit of last overlaps in the commercial models. On the technical level, I don't see so much difference. Absolutely, and Ulrich, do you have anything to add to that or, or shall I move on? You can move on because um, it's already everything set. <laughs> yeah, it covered that pretty comprehensively, I, I thought. Um, let's switch now to micro mobility, which clearly is a really, really important part of mobility as a service. And I think this is a really interesting question. So, regarding micro mobility service, do they drive mass or is mass driving their business models? And I'll put that to both of you to begin with again. Well, give it yeah, um, I'm just still thinking about the answer because uh, uh, I don't think in a per I, I think in a perfect wor world it's it's like a communicating system, so uh, there should not one be on top of the other. So so um, if there is an influence, vice versa, that would be the best because I spoke about competition and innovation and. I guess it's not good if a mobility service provider just develops their own uh, business models without reg regarding the other influences that might have on the market and vice versa. This would be the, the complete governing model, uh, as I showed in this table, that if, if, if a public transport authority would, would impose or uh, lots of restrictions um, on, on mobility service providers, then no business model, model can't evolve. So I guess this communicating system that should be enabled and then uh, platforms will be successful. Yeah, I, I agree, Oli, because if you look also at uh, the successful mass platforms put in place, 
they all include the micro mobility paths. I mean, uh, the if you remember the success factors that Revere sees is definitely that they say, okay, we need to in, in, connect as much micro mobility uh, players to the platform as possible in order to make it attractive. And I think from the other side, the micro mobility uh, providers what can they lose if they connect it? For them, it's just another sales channel to the market. So I think it's a symbiosis, like you said, uh, Uli, for um, playing together. Absolutely. And clearly, micro-mobility is such an important part of mass. But do you think a mass platform can survive and succeed without micro-mobility options available on it? Uh, depending on what you would like to offer. I mean, th th there can be some uh, cases where it's... Um, um possible um but of, of course if you you take them away you you're reducing also the the freedom and the options of the the people um it might be some cases where you just compare car with public transport or we you stay on on uh, with car share car oriented uh, paths uh, but I, I think if if we we're honest the majority of the mass platforms that are putting in place are requested are including micro mobility as well. If you want, of course, you can say that uh, mobility platforms without micro mobility already exists. If you look at the, uh, let's say, information platforms of, of uh, mainline operators, they do already have the last mile. Uh, already for years. So, so if, if, if you see a footpath, a bike or, or car to the station, uh, then, then this is already implemented. Maybe uh, not very often with uh, booking the service because uh, you, can't, you can't book your own bike. But uh, I guess from this point of, or from this level, we have to develop into the micro mobility. And of course, it's a lot of operators but, uh, and not to forget, some of them are just regional uh, in, in, or available in one region and not in the other. So um, yeah, we have, we have to add them as much as possible to give a complete overview of services. I think you're both absolutely spot on there. Um, please do keep your questions coming. I'll try and get for as many as I can. Um, this one's a really interesting one and a really important one, I think, as well. Do you think there is an opportunity to promote net zero and clean air, etc., in cities by demanding only sustainable transport modes be available to passengers on mass platforms? Well, we're getting into the, um, the at the level of the regulations um, and what you can impose to people. Um, I think there are two components uh, of uh, this. Uh, the first one is that we already indicated that the authority and the cities, they can have a strategy of using the mass for influencing behavior of people. And the influence, the behavior could also uh, mean taking less CO2 um, um, using the transport modes. So that's the first part. If it's not possible to impose this, the, at least what can be done is to make people more conscious about how what they're using and the co2 emission of the the different options and that they consciously say okay i would like to take this one because it's too it's uh, more eco-friendly and maybe one example is in luxembourg there you have they're working with leaves so if, if you have three leaves or four leaves i can't remember um, that is the best eco-friendly possible you're going by bike and then you take a e-scooter or whatever and you walk a little bit uh, the alternative would be no leaves at all because you're taking your own car driving to the car having a park and ride and going back so um i haven't i would be very interested let's put it that way to see if people are really influenced by this but definitely it um, it's making people more conscious about the decisions that they're taking when it comes to transportation I think <clears throat> overregulation would be to to quit services that are not eco-friendly, so not to show plain connections, for example. And uh, but what we can do besides just the information is also to incentivize uh, eco-friendly behavior in uh, with your business model. So giving bonus miles, bonus minutes, whatever you can imagine when using eco-friendly uh, transport. Uh, well, to, to 
well, just yeah, well, incentivize people uh, and uh, and and change their behavior. It's like a green loyalty program. <laughs> so to say, yeah. Absolutely. So it sounds like incentivizing green travel it really is the way to go to um to change the way that we do use transport. Um obviously I couldn't let you both off of a whole hour without mentioning the C word. So this is another good question. How is the recovery post pandemic and obviously we're talking about COVID nineteen going in terms of the mobility as a service sector? Yeah, well, I think um, there were many conferences and studies about the impacts on transportation by uh, COVID-19 and uh, one of the elements is definitely public transport reducing, the number of active traveling has been increasing, the number of people that if they are traveling then they're using more uh, um, individual cars again because they're afraid of going into the buses uh, because they are too full. Uh, but from the other side, we also see that a lot of public transport operators are anticipating uh, to this anxious, um, the, the, the anxiousness of uh, people. And one of the most demanded services from public operators related to the apps and the services of mobility or service is in occupancy indication and even occupancy prediction. And I think this is one of the strong elements that uh, that can be given uh, in, in the post-pandemic part is that bringing the confidence again back to people that if they're taking the public transport, for instance, that they can have the, the, the freedom to choose where, for instance, the bus will be less crowded if I take later or, um, or earlier. Um, and, and that accurate indication can come from such a mass platform, for instance, and the data, of course, that comes from a mass platform. And what we can see from uh, the, the public transport mark, market is uh, that, uh, on the other hand, uh, there is still a lot of funding, um, even from left from pre-corona pre times, and especially to, 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 to improve things after Corona, there are also another fundings uh, coming up and public transport operators already work on, on uh, tariff uh, products that uh, are trying to fit be better to the changed behavior, uh, the, the so-called new, new normal uh, working from home, uh, using, using public transport less and thus using mobility less. And so um, uh, this is one first step into new business models. And this is, well, just public transport, but, but we have to encourage authorities to, to, to evolve business models that, that don't focus only on public transport, but all, the whole mobility mix. And this is what will have to come up next. Reducing services because redu reduced uh, demand uh, is made up the solution to, to um, encourage people to go, come back to public transport. But on-demand services, micro-mobility uh, for the last miles could be something um, uh, for, for people who are anxious to use uh, crowded buses. So if you get on a scooter for the last mile, that could be, well, one way to come back to public and eco-friendly transport. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for your time today. I, I can't believe where that hour's gone, but it's such an interesting topic, so it's no surprise that we've run out of time. Uh, lots of questions unanswered. I'm sure that both our speakers today will get back to you as quickly as they possibly can with the answers to your questions. Um, please do join me in thanking Ged and Ulrich for their time today and for such a brilliant presentation. As you leave the webinar, a very short survey will appear on your screen asking you to rate the webinar. Please do take a moment to provide your feedback. Um, if now is not a good time, don't worry. The survey will also be sent to you shortly via email. If you could complete it when you get a minute, we would really, really appreciate it. On behalf of Intelligent Transport and Harkon, I'd like to thank you all very much for attending today's webinar. And we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye.